We're going to be talking about the dogma outside the church. There is no salvation on this program. And basically the dogma outside the church, there is no salvation, is simply uh, the summation of the truth that there is no salvation outside of Jesus Christ. And we find that taught uh, repeatedly throughout sacred scripture. We see it, for instance, in Acts 4.12, where it says, The name of our Lord Jesus Christ, nor is there salvation in any other. For there is no other name under heaven given to men whereby we must be saved. And Christ founded a church, of course. And so the only way to belong to Christ, to believe in his teaching fully and completely, and to adhere to what he wants us to adhere, is to reside in his mystical body. And that's why, in, for instance, John 15, 6, he says, If any man abide not in me, he will be cast forth as a branch and shall wither. And they shall gather him up into the fire, and he burneth. And we discussed a little bit last time um, where we get, you know, the magisterial teaching of the church. It's the magisterial teaching of the church sets forth the content of divine revelation. It sets forth the content of sacred scripture and sacred tradition. Uh, we discussed uh, how divine revelation ended with the death of the last apostle. Um, it's important also to understand the true meaning of dogma. And, and this is a key quote in that regard. This is from Pope Pius IX at the First Vatican Council on understanding dogmatic teaching. He says, quote, Hence also that sacred understanding of its dogmas must be perpetually retained, which Holy Mother Church has once declared. And there must never be a recession or a going away from that meaning under the specious name of a deeper understanding. And this is really important because you hear so many people today say, well, Yes, the church defined outside the church there is no salvation. The church has defined that all who die as non-Catholics are not saved. But uh, that doesn't mean what you're saying. There's later definitions in Vatican II and other things understand that. And this whole idea that there's a deeper understanding, okay, which contradicts the understanding which Holy Mother Church has once declared is condemned. And, and that's critical, and that's very important because we hear about those who talk about how there's um, you know, a loose interpretation of, of this dogma outside the church, there's no salvation, and that there's a strict interpretation of this dogma. That's a bunch of baloney. There's only what the church has once declared. That's the only interpretation there is. And uh, it's also important in this regard to quote, the proposition condemned by Pope St. Pius X in Lamentabili, the heirs of the monarchs. We made reference to it last time, but it, it really applies here. Um, he condemned the proposition, quote, The dogmas which the church professes as revealed are not truths fallen from heaven, but, but they are a kind of interpretation of religious facts. Condemned. Here's another one. The dogmas, is, as far as both the notion and the reality, are nothing but interpretations. Condemned. And so... We're going to look a little bit at the infallible definitions of the church, the ex cathedra pronouncements, those pronouncements by the popes which fulfill that specific criteria for a pope to speak infallibly, which we discussed last time. He must speak on a point of faith or morals. He must speak in virtue of his apostolic authority uh, to be believed by all Christians. And that has been fulfilled many times on this issue of outside the church there is no salvation. And I'm just going to read a few quotes uh, from the different popes reiterating this dogma. For instance, Pope St. Gregory the Great said, The Holy Universal Church teaches that it is not possible to worship God truly except in her and asserts that all who are outside of her will not be saved. Pope Innocent III, A.S. Exemplo 1208, he said, The Holy Roman Catholic and Apostolic Church, outside of which we believe that no one is saved. Pope Clement VI he said on September 20, 1351, in Super Qui Bustam, No man of the wayfarers outside the faith of this church and outside the obedience to the Pope of Rome can finally be saved. Uh, this is repeated again and again. Uh, Pope Gregory XVI, in one of the best encyclicals you can read, Mirari Vos, August 15, 1832, he says, quote, With the admonition of the apostle that there is one God, one faith, one baptism, May those fear who contrive the notion that the safe harbor of salvation is open to persons of any religion whatever. They should consider the testimony of Christ himself, that those who are not with Christ are against him, and that they disperse unhappily who do not gather with him, 
Therefore, without any doubt, they will perish forever who do not hold the Catholic faith whole and inviolate. This is uh, repeated by the same Pope, Gregory XVI, in one of my favorite encyclicals, Sumo Ujitur Studio, May 27, 1832. He says, Finally, some of these misguided people attempt to persuade themselves and others that men are not saved only in the Catholic religion, but that even heretics may attain eternal life. So he's saying these people who think that men are not saved only in the Catholic religion, in other words, that members of other religions can be saved, are wrong. Uh, Pope Pius IX repeats this many times. For instance, in uh, Nostis et Nobiscum, he says, in particular, ensure that the faithful are deeply and thoroughly convinced of the truth of the doctrine that the Catholic faith is necessary for attaining salvation. This doctrine received from Christ and emphasized by the fathers and councils is also contained in the formulae of the profession of faith. And we have many other quotes which we could mention. Now, I want to look at some of the solemn definitions. Those were examples of uh, popes speaking in their ordinary and universal magisterium, that they're simply repeating what the church has always held, what has always been the faith of the church. Uh, now we're going to look at some of the solemn definitions where the popes have met those criteria from Vatican I, where they're protected from uh, erring in any way. The first solemn definition on outside the church, there's no salvation, comes from Pope Innocent III at the Fourth Lateran Council, Constitution I, in the year 1215. This is an ecumenical or general council of the church, dogmatic council. He says, quote, There is indeed one universal church of the faithful, outside of which nobody at all is saved. Now, what's interesting is in all these definitions, we see that the language of the church is that outside of which no one at all is saved. That means that there are no exceptions. If there were exceptions, the church would have mentioned that. If there were exceptions for, quote, invincible ignorance or other matters, we would, we would see these mentioned. But in not any of the infallible definitions of, of this dogma do we find any exceptions mentioned whatsoever. And what's interesting about this is that when the Council of Trent defined the dogma that all men have original sin in Session 5 um, on, in its decree on original sin, it, in number one of that decree, it anathematizes anyone who would say that the sin of Adam did not harm all of his descendants. But in number six, it goes on to say, quote, This holy synod declares, nevertheless, that it is not its intention to include in this decree, where original sin is treated of, the blessed and immaculate Virgin Mary, Mother of God. So the Council of Trent, in infallibly defining that all men have original sin, was careful to make an exception for Our Lady in number six of that decree in session five of its decree on original sin. So that's a, a clear uh, example of how the church, when it speaks infallibly, takes into account any exceptions if they exist. So if there were exceptions to outside the church there's no salvation, it would have they would have been mentioned in the definitions. But they're not mentioned in any definitions. In fact, on the contrary, all exceptions are excluded. It says no one nobody, all, okay, it's all exclusive language. Now, what's interesting about this first definition of the dogma outside the church of no salvation is it says there is indeed one universal church of the faithful outside of which there is no salvation. Now, the faithful in the early church distinguished those who had been sacramentally baptized. Uh, that's why like many of you are familiar with the fact that there's the mass of the catechumens and the mass of the faithful. In the early church, the unbaptized catechumens had to leave mass before the creed. Only the faithful, only the sacramentally baptized, could profess the creed. And we see this in every liturgy of the church, Eastern Rite, Latin Church. We see the distinction between the mass of the catechumens and the mass of the faithful. That's why uh, a priest named Father Casimir Kucharik, who wrote a book on the history of the Eastern liturgy, uh, he pointed out how the liturgy of the catechumens, where this distinction between the faithful and the catechumens is made, is present in all rites of the church. Uh, he points out how St. Athanasius mentioned that they, the catechumens, were not allowed to be present at the mysteries. Okay, the Catholic Encyclopedia, uh, Volume 5, quotes uh, St. Augustine, who's asking people, he says, are you a catechumen or one of the faithful? Okay, that's why we have uh, a quote here from St. John Chrysostom. He talks about, he says, quote, 
For the catechumen is a stranger to the faithful. One has Christ for his king, the other sin and the devil. The food of one is Christ, of the other that meat which decays and perishes. And he goes on, since, since then we have nothing in common, meaning the faithful have nothing in common with the catechumens, meaning the unbaptized, in what, tell me, shall we hold communion? For if it should come to pass, which God forbid, that through sudden, the sudden arrival of death, we depart hence uninitiated, in other words, unbaptized, though we have 10,000 virtues, our portion will be none other than hell. Uh, St. Ambrose uh, repeats this in the 4th century. He says, For in the Christian what comes first is faith, and at Rome for this reason those who have been baptized are called the faithful. So we see that tradition, liturgy, the fathers of the church, they all teach that the unsacramentally baptized are not part of the faithful. That's the teaching of, of tradition. And this is so much the teaching of the tradition that even Dr. Ludwig Ott, in his book Fundamentals of Catholic Dogma, uh, he's modernist in many ways, but he actually said on page 309 of that book, catechumens are not to be counted among the members of the church. The church claims no jurisdiction over them. The fathers draw a sharp line of separation between catechumens and the faithful. So he's admitting that it's the universal teaching of tradition that catechumens are not part of the faithful. And we just saw that the first infallible definition of the church, dogmatic pronouncement protected by the Holy Ghost, was that there is indeed one universal church of the faithful, outside of which nobody at all is saved. No, absolutely nobody outside of the faithful can be saved. And that is just a devastating argument against anyone who would say that a person who hasn't been baptized could be in the church and saved, when the very first definition is clearly using the language for the sacramentally baptized. And this is not some quote from a theologian. It's not some quote from a catechism. This is an infallibly defined dogma of the faith. The first one on outside the church, there's no salvation. The second one, uh, second infallible definition on outside the church, there's no salvation, comes from Pope Boniface VIII in his bull Unum Sanctum, November 18, 1302. Uh, he says, with faith urging us, we are forced to believe in, and to hold the one holy Catholic and apostolic church and we firmly believe and simply confess this church outside of which there is no salvation nor remission of sins. Furthermore, we declare, say, define, and proclaim to every human creature that they, by absolute necessity for salvation, are entirely subject to the Roman pontiff. Again, we see the absolute exclusion. No one, every human creature. Now, if we believe in papal infallibility, okay, that means that God is watching over this decree. God is in charge of his church. Okay, we know from Vatican I, he, he is protected from error when speaking ex cathedra. Therefore, if this were not true, if it did not apply to every human creature, God would never allow the church to find this. And so that's why those who would say, well, you know, there are exceptions for, you know, certain Jews or Buddhists or, you know, a Muslim or whatever, they're, they're really lacking essential faith in Jesus Christ because they're saying that Jesus Christ really didn't watch over this definition. He really, you know, didn't, you know, make sure the church was free from error in promulgating this. Now, what's interesting is that this definition also has major application to the necessity of the sacrament of baptism because as we discussed last time, uh, it says every human creature must be entirely subject to the Roman pontiff for salvation. Well, that's every human creature, infant, everyone. Well, the way that you're made subject to the Roman pontiff is through baptism. In fact, we see this repeated by Pope Leo XIII in his encyclical Nobilissima, number three, in 1884. He says, the church, guardian of the integrity of the faith, has to call all nations to the knowledge of Christian lore, and which is constantly bound to watch keenly over the teaching and upbringing of the children placed under its authority by baptism. Okay, the children, the infants come into the jurisdiction of the church. They come into the authority of the church through baptism. They're not in the authority of the church if they haven't received the sacrament of baptism. And this is actually an infallibly defined dogma, as we see from Session 14, Chapter 2 of the Council of Trent on the Sacraments of Baptism and Penance from Pope Julius III. He says, since the church exercises judgment, meaning jurisdiction, on no one who has not previously entered it by the gate of baptism. And he quotes St. Paul, 
For what have I to do with those who are without? 1 Corinthians 5.12 says the apostle. It is otherwise with those of the household of the faith, whom Christ the Lord by the laver of baptism has once made members of his own body. So we see it's a dogma that every human creature must be subject to the Roman pontiff. It's a dogma that the church exercises jurisdiction over no one who has not entered through baptism. It, it logically follows. You can No human creature could be saved without the sacrament of baptism because every human creature must be subject to the Roman pontiff. And we actually, we see this repeated. Um, this is a new quote that's going to be new to uh, the second edition of this book, our book, Outside the Catholic Church, There's Absolutely No Salvation. This is from Pope St. Pius V in his bull excommunicating the heretical Queen Elizabeth of England in 1570. He says, The sovereign jurisdiction of the one holy Catholic and apostolic church outside of which there is no salvation, has been given by him, Jesus Christ, but to one person on the face of the earth, to Peter, the principles of the apostles, and he goes on to say the successor of Peter. So he's saying that the sovereign jurisdiction of the church is given to the Roman pontiff. That That's why every person baptized into the true church is made subject to the Roman pontiff. And they don't sever that subjection until they become a heretic or a schismatic. At that point, they sever that subjection and sever their membership in the church. So we can see that even this definition provides a, another devastating argument from not a catechism, not a fallible theologian, but from a dogmatic pronouncement that no one can be saved without the sacrament of baptism. The next definition is from Pope Clement V at the Council of Vienne in 1311, excuse me. He says, since, however, there is for both regulars and seculars, for superiors and subject, for exempt and non-exempt, one universal church, outside of which there is no salvation, for all of whom there is one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. So we again see no salvation outside the church, one universal church, one faith, one Lord, one baptism. Uh, the next one is from Pope Eugene IV at the Council of Florence in Section 8. He's reiterating the Athanasian Creed, uh, which is a key creed. Um, pertaining to this issue, and he says, whoever wishes to be saved needs above all to hold the Catholic faith. Unless each one preserves this whole and inviolate, he will, th will without a doubt perish e in eternity. Um, the next one comes from Pope Eugene IV in the bull Cantate Domino uh, at the Council of Florence, and he says, quote, the Holy Roman Church firmly believes, professes, and preaches that all those who are outside the Catholic Church not only pagans, but also Jews, heretics, and schismatics cannot share an eternal life and will go into the everlasting fire which was prepared for the devil and his angels unless they are joined to the church before the end of their lives and that the unity of, the, of this ecclesiastical body is of such importance that only those who abide in it do the church's sacraments contribute to salvation, do fasts, almsgivings, and other works of piety and practices of the Christian militia productive of eternal rewards and that nobody can be saved no matter how much he has given away in alms and even if he has shed blood in the name of Christ unless he has persevered in the bosom and unity of the Catholic Church. So we see all the pagans, all the Jews, all the heretics, all the schismatics are infallibly declared by the dogmatic teaching of the Church to be outside the Church and lost as if they die as such. Now, we have many people today in the traditional movement. Yeah, like, I mean, you have the Society of Pius X, for example, um, who we're going to get into more how they reject this teaching. Uh, that the Catholic faith is necessary for salvation. And um, I, I challenge anyone, actually, to go into the Society of Pius X bookstores where you, where you will find these books, usually or always. And this, unfortunately, this teaching that the Catholic faith is necessary for salvation is actually was denied by Archbishop Lefebvre himself, sadly. And you can find, for example, these quotes. Uh, this is the, his book, Against the Heresies. On page 216, he says, Souls can be saved in a religion other than the Catholic religion, Protestantism, Islam, Buddhism, etc., but not by this religion. Okay, and then on page 217, he says, One cannot say then that no one is saved in these religions. And then on pages 217 and 218, he says, quote, this is then what Pius IX said and what he condemned. It is necessary to understand the formulation that was so often employed by the fathers of the church. Outside the church, there is no salvation. When we say that, it is incorrectly believed 
that we think that all the Protestants, all the Muslims, all the Buddhists, all those who do not publicly belong to the Catholic Church go to hell. Now I repeat, it is possible for someone to be saved in these religions, but they are saved by the church. Okay, and him saying that they are saved by the church means absolutely nothing. That's like saying that all men uh, are saved, but they're saved by the death of Christ. And so, yeah, and, and he's clearly saying that souls can be saved in these religions. Well, we just quoted the infallible teaching of the church from Eugene the Fourth, where he's saying all of these members of these religions are lost. It's clearly heretical, and that's why we also quoted Summa Ugitur Studio. Pope Gregory the Sixteenth, where he explicitly says, these misguided people attempt to persuade themselves and others that men are not saved only in the Catholic religion. So he's e exactly contradicting uh, the heretical words of Lefebvre. In fact, here's another uh, quote from Lefebvre, a sermon at the first mass of a newly ordained priest in Geneva, 1976. But those who are saved even outside the church are saved by the Catholic church. So he's saying here that people are saved outside the church, okay? And the dogma is there's no salvation outside the church. So you have actually a word-for-word -word denial of the dogma of the church that there's no salvation outside the church. And uh, actually, here's uh, Lefebvre again in, in France, an address he gave, quote, he says, uh, quote, if men are saved in Protestantism, Buddhism, or Islam, they are saved by the Catholic church. Uh, by the grace of our Lord, by the prayers of those in the church, by the blood of our Lord as individuals, perhaps through the practice of their religion, perhaps of what they understand in their religion, but not by their religion. So here again, you have um, a denial of the dogma that you need the Catholic faith for salvation. The profession of faith of Pius IV, the Council of Trent, says this Catholic faith outside of which no one can be saved. Uh, this is un, you know, denied here. By Lefebvre. Um, and, you know, these books are sold basically at every single bookstore of the Society Pius X. The people have not read them. Most of the people, unfortunately, it seems like they don't care that they're there. Uh, a lot of the people, when we tell them about this information, deny it. They say, no, oh, no. Oh, yes, this is happening. And this is what they're teaching. You need, you need to wake up and realize it. And then because if you contribute to them, if you go there, you're saying in God's eyes there's no problem with them preaching this heresy. And um, here, here again, actually, here's Open Letter to Confused Catholics by Lefebvre, another one of their best-selling books that Angelus Press would sell. Pages 73 and 74, he says, quote, Does this mean that no Protestant, no Muslim, no Buddhist or animist will, will be saved? No, it would be a second error to think that. You know, so, um, you know, this is this is just something that's believed, not, and it's not just believed by the Society of Pius X, it's believed by the CMRI, of course, it's believed by the Society of Pius V, it's believed by most every independent priest who offers the Latin Mass. They do not believe that you have to absolutely have the Catholic faith for salvation. They do not believe you have to be a baptized Catholic to be saved. It's just a fact. People need to realize this. To contribute any amount of money to them is to support heresy and heretics and these heretical books that they're putting out. And what's interesting is that all of this is a clear rejection of the pure definitions we've quoted. It's a clear recession from that meaning which has once been declared by the church. And this whole issue was the key to the great apostasy. It was the key to what we're dealing with right now. It was pre-Vatican II heretics who believe that outside the church there is no salvation doesn't really mean outside the church there is no salvation, who paved the way for the explosion of apostasy at Vatican II. Once it started to be accepted as it was before Vatican II through heretical uh, catechisms, through heretical theological manuals, which totally watered down and gutted the real truth and power and meaning of this dogma, that it was accepted basically everywhere that we don't really know who's saved, and, and Jews could make it, and, and anyone could make it. That destroyed the faith, and the next step was the post-Vatican II, uh, the Vatican II documents. For those above the age of reason, the Church has infallibly defined that it's necessary that they accept the essential mysteries and know the essential mysteries of the Trinity and the Incarnation. This has been declared in 
uh, decree after decree when uh, people were inquiring about, you know, what is the bare minimum to know for people to be baptized. And the Trinity in the Incarnation is, they constitute the mysteries of Catholic faith, which are absolutely necessary as a necessity of means. And this is held by all the doctors of the church. This is held by all the popes. It's, it's proclaimed in the Athanasian Creed, where we see um, the infallible definition of the necessity of the Catholic faith. And in that infallible definition, it says, but the Catholic faith is this, that we worship one God in the Trinity and the Trinity in unity. And it goes on about how there's one God and three divine persons. And it says, therefore, let him who wishes to be saved think thus concerning the Trinity. And what's really interesting about this is that in this definition, we see how God protects the infallible dogmas of the church because it says, therefore, let him who wishes to be saved think thus concerning the Trinity. Well, obviously, infants are not required to have a knowledge of the Trinity and the Incarnation being below the age of reason. So in this language, we see the allowance for that exception. We see, therefore, let him who wishes to be saved, only those above the age of reason can wish to be saved. And it's declaring that all who can wish to be saved, meaning all above the age of reason, need to believe in the Trinity. And they also say, but it is also necessary for salvation that he faithfully believe in the Incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God is God and man. This is the Catholic faith. Unless each one believes this faithfully and firmly, he cannot be saved. So in terms of its simplest components, belief in the Trinity and the Incarnation are the absolutely necessary essential mysteries of the faith which no man above the age of reason can be ignorant of and be saved. That's why the missionaries, St. Isaac Jogue, St. Francis Xavier, when they would preach, they absolutely uh, made sure to instruct them in the essential mysteries of faith before baptism. And if they died in ignorance of the gospel, they were lost. That's the teaching of the fathers of the church, the saints of the church, the doctors of the church. And people say, well, what, where's the justice in that? And as we were discussing last time, we must believe first and understand second. We must accept what God has said and then understand why it makes sense later on. And the fact of the matter is that most men are of bad will, as our Lord taught in Matthew 7:13 by teaching that the broad is the way that leadeth to hell, and few find the way to salvation. Few find the way to salvation. And God obviously sees that those people who are left in ignorance of the gospel were not of good will. They were left in ignorance of the gospel because they would have rejected the gospel. And this is actually what we see taught. Um, so actually, before we get to that, it's, it's important to actually give this scriptural proof for baptism. So we're going to back up a little bit. In Matthew 28, 19 to 20, we find the great commission of our Lord, where he, the last command he gives to the apostles, he says, All power is given to me in heaven and earth. Going therefore, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. So in the very last command, we see the necessity to teach and baptize. Baptism is is so critical that it's it's one of the two essential things he mentions in the last great commission we see this repeated in mark 16 15 to 16 saint mark's version of this uh jesus said to them go into the whole world and preach the gospel to every creature he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved but he he that believeth not shall be condemned and some people say well why didn't he say but he that believeth not and is not baptized shall be condemned well because those who do not believe are not going to get baptized so the repetition is is unnecessary an interesting passage of scripture illustrating the necessity of baptism as the teaching of Jesus Christ is Galatians chapter 3. And in Galatians 3, St. Paul's speaking about faith over and over again. He talks about before the faith came that we may be justified by faith, but after the faith has come, for you are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Well, what does he mean by this repetition of faith over and over again? The faith, the faith. Well, he explains it. In the very next verse, Galatians 3.27, For as many of you as have been baptized in Christ have put on Christ. So you receive the faith through baptism. This is the teaching of St. Paul. And that's why, actually, in the baptismal rite, before the unbaptized catechumen receives the sacrament of baptism, he's asked, what does he desire from the church? And he says, faith. And the, he received, that's why the sacrament of baptism is actually called the sacrament of faith, because that's what makes you a member of the faithful. And that is what gives you the faith. And we see this clearly in the teaching of the fathers of the church, like St. Ambrose, 
And the Council of Trent, again, confirms this passage of, of Scripture by teaching in section 6, chapter 7, that the instrumental cause of justification is the sacrament of baptism, which is the sacrament of faith. Without faith, no one is ever justified. Uh, another very powerful, and by the way, all of this destroys the Protestant theology, which rejects the necessity of baptism for salvation. I mean, I mean, nothing could be clearer in Scripture. I mean, so the fact that they claim to be Bible-believing Christians while rejecting the necessity of baptism for every man, it's just ridiculous. In Titus 3.5, we see again a powerful passage of Scripture on this topic. Uh, quote, Titus 3.5, Not by the works of justice which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us, by the laver of regeneration and renovation of the Holy Ghost. So, again, St. Paul, in the infallible word of God, telling us that the laver of regeneration, meaning water baptism, saves us. That's how we, he has saved us. Uh, what's interesting about this is that St. Paul says that it's not by the works of justice which we have done that we are saved. In other words, it's not by our desire or our blood or our almsgiving. Or, it's by the sacrament of baptism. That's the initial thing that you must have, okay, to be justified. And, and no work of ours can replace that. And that's actually why many of the Protestants twist the passages in Scripture where it talks about not by works to their own damnation, where St. Paul's talking about the initial grace of justification, receiving the sacrament of baptism. There's no work you can do which could replace that. And, and so they misunderstand it, and actually seeing this verse, Titus 3, 5, is the key to explain some of these other ones that they quote. Uh, another key passage uh, in the New Testament concerning the sacrament of baptism is Ephesians 4, 5. Careful to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace, one body and one spirit, as you are called in the hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father. So we see in the Word of God again, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, one Father. So we see baptism is right there with Father, God, Lord. That's how necessary it is. That's that's how critical it is. Just as, as necessary to be incorporated into the unity as acknowledging these other things. And that's why St. Jerome says in 386, The Lord is one and God is one. The faith is said to be one. And there's one baptism for it is in one and the same way that we are baptized, in the Father and in the Son and in the Holy Spirit. You know, and a good question to ask these people who believe in baptism of desire and blood is, how many baptisms do they confess? If you're a Catholic, you confess one baptism celebrated in water. Okay, if you're not a Catholic, you confess more than one baptism. It's really that simple. So, you know, do you confess one baptism or do you confess three baptisms? You have to make up your mind because... If you believe in one baptism, then you're, you are a Catholic. If you do not believe in one baptism, you are not a Catholic. And, and what's interesting about that is the Council of Vienne, which was another dogmatic council under Pope Clement V in 1311, 1312, it said just what he's saying, besides one baptism which regenerates all who are baptized in Christ must be faithfully confessed by all, just as there is one God and one faith, Ephesians 4, 5, so it's quoting that scripture, which is celebrated in water. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, we believe to be commonly the perfect remedy for salvation for adults as for children. So it's a dogmatic text confirming Ephesians 4, 5, and just what he's saying about one baptism in water. I'm just going to go through two or three more passages in Scripture. Acts 2, we see in the first papal sermon, excuse me, at Pentecost, we see uh, St. Peter addressing the people, now, when they had heard these things, they had compunction in their heart and said to Peter and to the rest of the apostles, What shall we do, men and brethren? But Peter said to them, Do penance and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So we see in the very first papal sermon the necessity of being baptized for the remission of sins, every one of them. And we see this confirmed in the Nicene Constantinople Creed, which is recited in, at Mass. We confess one baptism for the remission of sins. And one of the most powerful passages in Scripture is 1 Peter 3, 20-21, where it says, quote, When they waited for the patience of God in the days of Noah, when the ark was a building, 
wherein a few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water, wherein to baptism being of the like form now saveth you also. Again, we saw in Titus 3.5 where it says baptism saves you. Here we have St. Peter saying infallibly, baptism being of the like form now saveth you also. And he compares receiving baptism to those who were saved from the flood. So that if you don't receive the waters of baptism, you will perish just as those who perished in the flood. The biggest passage, though, to consider in this regard is John 3, 5, of course, where our Lord says to Nicodemus, Amen, amen, I say unto thee, unless a man is born again of water and the Holy Ghost, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. And every time the church has addressed that passage, we quoted uh, one of them already, the church has taken those words literally. And this is in the Council of Florence, in all the passages, there are four mentions of it in the Council of Trent. And they're all literal, okay? And, for instance, Pope Eugene IV at the Council of Florence says, quote, Holy baptism, which is the gateway to the spiritual life, holds the first place among all the sacraments. Through it, we are made members of Christ and the body of the Church. And since death entered the universe through the first man, Unless we are born again of water and the Spirit, we cannot, as the truth says, enter into the kingdom of heaven. John 3, 5. The matter of this sacrament is real and natural water. So we see the necessity to accept the literal interpretation of John 3, 5. That's the teaching of the church. No one can be saved without the waters of baptism. Now, I think we should get into now where this idea of baptism of desire came from. First, we, we need to point out that the early earliest fathers from the apostolic times saw this truth of Scripture, the necessity of baptism, and they repeated it. In the letter of Barnabas in 70 AD, we, we read, we descend into the water full of sins and foulness. We come up bearing fruit in our hearts. So he's seen the bath, water regeneration from the earliest time, okay, and it's necessary. In 140, uh, the early church father Hermas quotes our Lord in John 3, 5, says, they had need to come up through the water so that they might be made alive, for they could not otherwise enter into the kingdom of heaven. Okay, in 155, St. Justin the Martyr says, They are led by us to a place where there is water, and they are reborn in the same kind of rebirth in which we ourselves were reborn. For Christ said, Unless you be reborn, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. The reason for doing this we have learned from the apostles. All the early church fathers, we give you quote after quote after quote, from the Father saying the necessity of being born again of water and the Spirit. That's the universal teaching of the fathers of the church. And they talk about how receiving baptism, that you're receiving the seal, which is a very you know important point. Yeah, you see that from the earliest part of the church, like Hermas in 140 AD. He says, before a man bears the name of the Son of God, he is dead. But when he receives the seal, he puts mortality aside and again receives life. The seal, therefore, is the water. They go into the water dead and come out of it alive. St. Ephraim, 350. We are anointed in baptism whereby we bear his seal. St. Gregory Nyssa, 380. Make haste, O sheep, towards the sign of the cross and the seal, baptism, which will save you from your misery. We have St. Ephratus, who is the oldest of the Syrian fathers. He writes in 336. He says, This then is faith, that a man believe in God, his spirit, his Christ, also that a man believe in the resurrection of the dead, and moreover that he believe in the sacrament of baptism. This is the belief of the Church of God. So we can see that he's saying that the most essential things here, one of which is believing in the sacrament of baptism. I think it's important to establish this because there's so many people today who are rejecting this and, uh, and lying about the testimony of tradition on the necessity of baptism. And, and we'll cover that, but it's important to establish these points. Uh, so I'm just going to go through a few more here. St. Cyril of Jerusalem, 350. He, he quotes our Lord in John 3, 5, Unless a man be born again, he says, of water and the Holy Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And he says, If a man be virtuous in his deeds, but does not receive the seal by means of the water, shall he enter the kingdom of heaven? A bold saying, but not mine, for it is Jesus who has declared it. St. Basil the Great says the same thing. Uh, St. Gregory of Elrira, he says, Christ is called net, because through him and in him, thy diverse multitudes of people are gathered from the sea of the world through the water of baptism and into the church. Then we have Pope St. Damasus in 382. This then is the salvation of Christians, believing in the Trinity and baptized in it. You have uh, St. Ambrose in 390-391. He goes, quote, You have read, therefore, that the three witnesses in baptism are one, water, blood, and the Spirit. And if you withdraw any of one of these, 
the sacrament of baptism is not valid. For what is the water without the cross of Christ, a common element without any sacramental effect? Nor, on the other hand, is there any mystery of regeneration without water. For unless a man be born again of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. John 3, 5. Even a catechumen believes in the cross of our Lord, by which he is signed. But unless he be baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, he cannot receive the remission of sins, nor be recipient of the gift of spiritual grace. And then you have him saying in 391 again, he says, quote, For no one ascends into the kingdom of heaven except through the sacrament of baptism. And then again, you have him saying, quote, Unless a man be born again of water and the Holy, Holy Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. No one accepted, not the infant, not the one prevented by some necessity. So you see this uh, teaching of St. Ambrose again confirming the truth of the gospel that a person has to be born again of war and the Holy Ghost to be saved. And what's interesting is uh, Father William Jurgens in his three-volume set, The Faith of the Early Fathers, which is a good compilation of some of the main quotes from the fathers. He's a modernist. He accepts invincible ignorance and baptism of desire could apply to basically anyone. But he's forced to admit in his book Quote, if there were not a constant tradition in the fathers that the gospel message of unless a man be born again of water and the Holy Ghost, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God, is to be taken absolutely. It would be easy to say that our Savior simply did not see fit to mention the obvious exceptions of invincible ignorance and physical impossibility. But the tradition, in fact, is there, and it is likely enough to be found so constant as to constitute revelation. So you have this modernist, patristic scholar admitting that the fathers are constant on the necessity of John 3, 5. There were fathers who postulated certain exceptions, like a handful, but that was not the universal tradition. For instance, you had the idea that certain martyrs for the faith who had not been baptized could be saved. And this was held by certain fathers, never taught infallibly by the church. If we look at the earliest passages that people try to quote, for instance, in favor of Baptism of blood. I just want to get it here. The earliest one comes from Tertullian, who also is quoted in absolutely affirming the necessity of baptism. In 203, he says, If they might be washed in water, they might necessarily be so by blood. This is the baptism which replaces that of the fountain, meaning water baptism, when it has not been received and restores it when it has been lost. So this is actually the first statement from a father on the idea of baptism of blood. Well, what's interesting about this, in the very same document on baptism, Tertullian also says, quote, according to circumstances and disposition and even age of the individual person, it may be better to delay baptism, and especially so in the case of little children. Let them come then while they grow up. So he's saying that infants should not be baptized in infancy, but infants should be baptized when they grow up. That obviously is, is ridiculous and contrary to the teaching of the church, which is that infants cannot be saved without baptism and that they're supposed to be, according to the Council of Florence, baptized immediately. So the point here is that he's making a significant mistake in the very process of explaining his idea of baptism of blood. The point is he's fallible. Okay, it's The church has never taught what he says here. And that's why in all these cases where these people try to quote a saint here or a saint there who believes in the concept of baptism of desire or blood, they're making mistakes in the, in the very process of explaining it. It's not uh, protected by the infallible teaching of the church. The church doesn't teach that. And what's interesting is that even some of the early fathers who, the idea of baptism of desire, okay, that it could apply to a catechumen who didn't shed his blood for Christ, was held by one father of the church, rejected by the rest. The only one who was held by was St. Augustine, who also rejected the idea. He was on both sides of the issue. Okay, so this idea that the, the fathers of the church were in favor of the idea of baptism of desire and that they were unanimously in favor of baptism of desire, it's just a complete lie. And we're actually going to... Yeah, and actually St. Augustine, 391, he says, uh, When we have come into God's sight, we shall behold the equity of God's justice. Then no one will say, Why was this man led by God's direction to be baptized? while this man, though he lived properly as a catechumen, was killed in a sudden disaster and was not baptized. Look for rewards, and you will find nothing except punishments. And then he says again, St. Augustine, however much progress the catechumen should make, 
He st- still carries the load of his iniquity, nor is it removed from him unless he comes to baptism. So you see St. Augustine seemingly making, obviously, statements on both sides of this issue. Well, what's interesting is that we were talking about how certain fathers believed in the concept of baptism of blood. And I just want to quote another one, St. Cyril of Jerusalem, 350 A.D. He says, if any man does not receive baptism, he does not receive salvation. The only exception is the martyrs. Okay, so St. Cyril of Jerusalem, according to him, the only exception is the martyrs. Now, we point out there are no exceptions. The church teaches there are no exceptions. The universal witness of the fathers is that every man has to be baptized. Baptism of blood is not the universal witness of the father. But I'm giving you an example of a father who did believe in this wrong idea of baptism of blood. But he's saying that it only applies to the martyrs. Well, what are the people who claim to believe what these saints believe today hold? They hold that it applies to Buddhists and Jews. I mean, how far we are from what they held is uh, just ridiculous. Here's another one, St. Fulgens. He was one of the other about eight who can be quoted in favor of baptism of blood. He rejected baptism of desire, though. He says, from that time at which our Savior said, if anyone is not reborn of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. No one can without the sacrament of baptism, except those who in the Catholic Church without baptism pour out their blood for Christ. So according to St. Fulgence, there is no baptism of desire. The only exception is baptism of blood. Well, we have these books on baptism of desire for, written by members of the Society of St. Pius X, which quote this passage to try to prove baptism of desire when he's denying it. And this shows how ridiculous it is for these people who hide their heresy of believing that Jews and Buddhists and Muslims can be saved under the idea of baptism of blood. Pope Eugene IV, we already quoted his infallible definition on outside the church of no salvation. At the end of it, he actually says, no one, even if he pour out his blood for the name of Christ, can be saved unless he abide within the bosom and unity of the Catholic Church. He could have obviously made an exception for baptism of blood if, if it were true, but he doesn't. And the fact of the matter is that God would keep any sincere soul alive. That's why we, we see all kinds of miraculous baptisms, even ones where people were ready for martyrdom, uh, water come shooting out uh, of the ground. Now, I wanted to establish that to show that baptism of desire, the idea that a person who desires water baptism and dies before it, was not held by almost anyone. Uh, The only one who speculated on the idea in the early church was St. Augustine, who contradicted himself on it and and rejected the idea as well. And I, I wanted to quote a passage here. He quoted St. Augustine uh, earlier, but there's an interesting passage where he says that he's considered this topic again and again. And he says in 400 that the place of baptism is sometimes supplied by suffering, is supported by a substantial argument, which the same blessed Cyprian draws. So this is interesting because he's saying that the baptism of blood idea is not supported in any teaching of the church or tradition of the apostles. He's saying it's supported in some argument of St. Cyprian. Okay, it's not a tradition of God, it's a tradition of man. And he goes, considering this over and over again, I find that not only suffering for the name of Christ can supply for that which is lacking in baptism, but even faith and conversion of heart, meaning a person who desires water baptism, if recourse cannot be had to the celebration of the mystery of baptism. So he's saying that he has discovered that he's considered this. Okay, that's a key point. He's he's not quoting any authority, any infallible church. This is a conclusion that he's come to as a fallible man. Yeah, he's speculating on these issues, and when you speculate about these issues without the backing of the infallible definitions of the church, you run into making mistakes. And in the case of St. Augustine, you know, he's writing at least, what, one or two books of corrections on the mistakes that he made during his life on theological issues. Yeah, that's, that's right. He's made, he issued a whole book of corrections, you know, revising arguments. Okay, so, but this is a key point for people to understand that the, the only early church father, we have all kinds of fathers, and we're going to get some more of them, who say that catechumens cannot be saved without baptism, just rejecting the idea of baptism of desire. This is the only one who they can quote for the idea, which is now basically held by almost all people who uh, profess to be, not all, but a large portion of those who profess to be traditional Catholic. Uh, he's saying, I have considered this over and over again, and I find. Now, what's interesting is he denied this repeatedly. For instance, in 391, did you quote that one? Yes. Okay, where he says, you know, the catechumen could not be saved. And so he was on both sides of the issue. The only one they can quote, and St. Ambrose, he quoted already, said a catechumen who dies before baptism 
cannot have the remission of his sins. Then we have St. Gregory Nazianzen, okay, one of the great fathers of the church. Uh, and the liturgy actually says about him, In the opinion of learned and holy men, there is nothing to be found in his writings which is not conformable to true piety and Catholic faith, or which anyone could reasonably call in question. That's what it says about St. Gregory Nazianzen. But it's, he says, he just explicitly rejects the idea. He says, uh, still others are not able to receive baptism, perhaps because of infancy or some perfectly involuntary circumstance, which prevents them from receiving the gift, even if they desire it. And he says, and he, he rejects this idea. He goes, if you were able to judge a man who intends to commit murder solely by his intention and without any act of murder, then you could likewise reckon as baptized one who desired baptism without having re received baptism. I cannot see it. If in your opinion, desire has equal power with actual baptism, then make the same judgment in regard to glory. So he's explicitly asserting that he rejects this idea of baptism of desire. Now, I want you to keep that in mind because the Society of St. Pius X has published a number of books on baptism of desire. And these books, the arguments are promoted by all kinds of different groups and traditionalists. And they actually say, and this is promoted by others, uh, that... I, I, I have to get the exact quote here. It's so absurd. Yeah, I mean, it's something where the belief that people in other religions can be saved through baptism of desire and blood is held by about 99% of the, the both the, quote, traditional priests that are out there and also the laity that are out there. I mean, a lot of the people that actually we tell about, uh, we give this information that, you know, your priest believes that people in other religions can be saved without the Catholic faith. And then they say, oh, no, I don't think he believes that. I don't think the group believes that. And then you find out later that the very person you're speaking to actually holds the same position. So Yeah, and we were talking about, we just quoted St. Gregory Nazianz and, uh, who rejected baptism of desire. We quoted St. Augustine who said catechumens can't be saved. He was on both sides of the issue. We quoted St. Ambrose who said catechumens can't be saved. We're, we're about to quote St. John Christum. But this is the Society of St. Pius X, book Baptism of Desire, page 63. The existence of baptism desire is a truth taught by the magisterium, which is not true, and held from the first centuries by all the fathers. No Catholic theologian has contested it. I mean, this is just a pure lie. And the people who read this stuff, they're brainwashed. And if they don't know any better, and if no one's refuting this, and if they're not reading, for instance, our material, they're going to imbibe this, thinking that all the fathers of the church held baptism desire. I've read this so many times. It's such an outrage. And it's repeated yeah. by Father Francois Lenay in his book, his horrible book, which we'll cover more, Is Phenism Catholic, page 79. It is not only the common teaching, meaning baptism of desire, but unanimous teaching. It is not only since the early part of this millennium, but from the beginning of the church. Total lie. Yeah, in fact, actually, when Father Peter Scott was in the United States of America, and he held up uh, one of our magazines saying that, that, that this is filled with lies and Archbishop Lefebvre held what all the early church fathers believed about baptism. People being saved in other religions? Sorry. That yeah. wasn't held by the early church fathers. So that's just an outright lie. And, um, you know, they don't tell you too much publicly that uh, they believe people in other religions can be saved. But it's sure all over their books on this issue. I wanted to give a few more details here on some of their other books on this issue. One of their books that was promoted in the Angelus and sold is called Baptism of Desire by Father John Mark Rouleau. And this is a book uh, purporting to give the Catholic teaching on the necessity of baptism or lack thereof and the necessity of the church for salvation. It's supposedly an analysis of what the fathers teach and basically what the church teaches on the water baptism issue. In the whole book, the author doesn't quote even one of the ex cathedra pronouncements on outside the church's no salvation. This is a book dedicated to the necessity of the church in water baptism for salvation. And the author doesn't quote one of the ex cathedra definitions on outside the church and no salvation in the whole book. That's just amazing. The reason, obviously, is because he doesn't believe in them, because he believes in salvation outside the church, so he's not very inclined to produce what the church has infallibly declared. He has a whole section in the book, this is the book Baptism of Desire, on whether it's necessary to have explicit or implicit faith in Jesus Christ for salvation. But he doesn't quote anywhere in the book the Athanasian Creed, the dogmatic symbol of faith which declared that you must believe in Jesus Christ and the Trinity as the essential mysteries of faith for salvation. He doesn't quote it anywhere. He doesn't quote, this is amazing, 
in the whole book, Canons 2 or 5 from the Council of Trent's Canons on the Sacrament of Baptism, where it says in Canon 5, if anyone shall say that baptism is optional, that is not necessary for salvation, let him be anathema. In Canon 2, which says, if anyone shall say that real and natural water is not necessary for baptism, and those words of our Lord Jesus Christ in John 3, 5, unless a man is born again of water and the Holy Spirit are distorted into some sort of metaphor, let him be anathema. That's not quoted anywhere in the book. And this is a book on the necessity of baptism. He does mention, however, that it's an error to attribute infallibility to every document of the magisterium. That, of, of course, is heresy. He says on page 61, justifying faith can come from the Christian elements of false religions. On page 63, he says it's difficult to say whether believing that God is a rewarder is all that is necessary to be saved. So, like, even if you're, you know, a Muslim and you believe that God is a rewarder, you know, that, that could be enough, according to page 63 of Baptism of Desire. Same page says that, quote, it says, It cannot be granted that justifying faith occurs normally in every religious tradition. Well, that implies that it can occur in every religious tradition, just not normally speaking. Um, he also says that Baptism of Desire can occur among pagan paganism. Page 64. And he says also that to refuse St. Thomas Aquinas is to refuse the magisterium. Yeah. But then contradicts it. Yeah, on page um, 11 of this book, Father Rouleau says, quite simply, to refuse St. Thomas Aquinas is to refuse the magisterium of the church. He was talking about how great St. Thomas's authority is as a theologian. Well, this, of course, is ridiculous. To refuse St. Thomas Aquinas is to refuse the magisterium? That's just absurd. Okay, no, the church teaches, as Pius X said, that any of the scholastic doctors, when they hold something that's doubtful or contrary to something else, you can reject it. And that's why St. Thomas was wrong in the Immaculate Conception. But what's fascinating about this is he says that, and then on page 56 and 57, when he's discussing St. Thomas's position that you had to believe in Jesus Christ and the Trinity to be saved, he quotes the passages from St. Thomas, thus refuting invincible ignorance. And he says, how should this doctrine of St. Thomas be interpreted? What weight should it be given? The theologians have not been unanimous. Now, wait a second. I thought he said, quite simply, to refuse St. Thomas Aquinas is to refuse the magisterium. Now, when he's discussing St. Thomas's position on page 56 about whether you have to believe in Jesus Christ and the Trinity, he says, we don't know how much weight this should be given. I mean, it's just amazing. The only reason he says this, of course, is because he doesn't like what St. Thomas says here. And when he's discussing something he likes, St. Thomas says, he says, you know, you can't reject him. So, yes, yeah, authority may not have weight in those cases. And it's also important to mention, we mentioned it briefly, the incredible book called Is Fenianism Catholic by Father Francois Lenay. There's a very uh, detailed section on this in our book, Outside the Catholic Church, There's Absolutely No Salvation. This, again, was promoted prominently on the Angels, I think on the back cover, sold in their bookstores. This is an attack on the necessity of water baptism. It contains so many false arguments, so many lies. On page 47 of this evil book, Father Francois Lenay, who's one of the, the most despicable heretics in the Society of St. Pius X, he says, quote, Moreover, the very Council of Florence, in the very same decree for the Jacobites, part of the bull Cantate Domino, mentions baptism of desire. This is printed in the Society of St. Pius X's book, that the Council of Florence mentions baptism of desire. Completely untrue. As anyone who knows anything about the issue can tell you, the Council of Florence doesn't mention anything at all about baptism of desire. And yet, that's what he says in his book. Now, the reason he makes this lie, the reason he would try to justify it is that the Council of Florence in the Bull Cantate Domino is quoting many things from St. Thomas Aquinas. And it's when, it, when the Council of Florence define that children have no other remedy from original sin other than the sacrament of baptism, that's basically a quote from St. Thomas Aquinas. Now, in the Summa Theologica, St. Thomas Aquinas goes on to talk about, remember, we discussed how he was wrong and he believed in explicit baptism desire. St. Thomas Aquinas goes on in the Summa to talk about how, on the other hand, there is a remedy for adults without the sacrament of baptism in their desire for the sacrament of baptism. That's what St. Thomas says in the Summa. It's not infallible, okay, and we've pointed out why it's wrong. But the Council of Florence didn't include that part of St. Thomas Aquinas in its decree. It only included its, his part on children in the decree. Well, 
That's not a problem for Father Lene because he just put it in. He says that the Council of Florence mentions the part of St. Thomas. It doesn't. And, and see, that should tell people something. Why did the Holy Ghost, who's watching over these decrees, not have the Council of Florence include just – it's really interesting because if you look at the original passages of St. Thomas, if the Council of Florence would have just continued to quote him just a tiny bit more, it would have taught baptism desire. But it stopped. It didn't quote it at all. That's obviously, to those with faith, the intervention of the Holy Ghost, taking the part of St. Thomas which was true and incorporating – it into the dogmatic definition and leaving the part out that was not true. And and that's why it's not there. Anybody doesn't stop there, the liar, Father Francois Lanay, he talks about how Pius IX clearly mentions, uh, he says, this passage of Pope Pius IX shows clearly that baptism desire is not opposed to the dogma. Well, the passage of Pius IX doesn't mention anything about baptism desire. We discussed those last time. There, there are other uh, huge lies in this book. It's all, it's just... This issue of the salvation denial is, is characterized by deception. People trying to seize points here or there and elevate things that are not infallible and distort things, mistranslate things, trying to misuse things and even lie when necessary. And that's how the denial of this truth has, has been circulated so thoroughly. He says on page 85 to 86, The doctrine of baptism of blood and baptism of desire is inseparably linked by the church to the dogma outside the church there is no salvation it belongs to the very proper understanding of that dogma so that if one denies it he no longer holds that dogma in the same sense and the same words as the church holds it well if it, he's saying it's so inseparably linked to the dogma okay that's why in not one of the definitions was this doctrine ever mentioned it's so inseparably linked that we can find it nowhere in any dogmatic definition. We've pointed out that the Society of St. Pius V, unfortunately, also believes in salvation outside the church. Some of the people who like our material don't believe it, and uh, they said they don't actually believe that. And we've quoted the passages from their publication, The Roman Catholic, which deny it. And we were just sent another publication from the 2005. We hadn't seen this one. A uh, reader sent it. And on page 54 of their winter 2005 publication, the Roman Catholic, Society of St. Pius V, the, they, they have some questions and answers from pre-Vatican II Catholics, supposedly. And the, the question is, do Catholics believe that non-Catholics cannot be saved? That's the question. The answer is no. That's their answer, no. And they go on, and this is the answer they've endorsed in their, their publication. And they go on to explain how, through no fault of their own, etc., etc. This means that any Jew, Buddhist, Muslim, or even agnostic, or Hindu, or atheist who sincerely obeys his conscience can be saved. This is Vatican II. That's what the person who wrote us said. And she's right. That what they're endorsing is basically was the heresy that led to the Vatican II apostasy. Once you believe this, you don't believe in anything, basically. Yeah, the only difference between some of these so-called traditional groups and the Vatican II apostates is that the Vatican II apostates will actually praise these false religions, whereas these false traditionalists will not praise the false religions. But the conclusion of both of them is the same in regards to their eternal fate, that they can go to heaven. So, you know, Saudi Pius V, they believe they can go to heaven. So does the Vatican II Church. Yeah. So the fact that they uh, are against their religions, they're still saying that these people can be saved. What, as we covered last time, this catechism attributed to St. Pius X, there's no evidence it came from his pen. It's not infallible, and it contains clear heresy. It says that people can be saved who are outside the church, and that's directly contrary to the dogma that outside the church there is no salvation. And it says that these people who are outside the church are united somehow, which is a contradiction, to the church by means of the soul of the church, even though they're not part of the body of the church. And this idea that you can be united to the soul of the church and not part of the body of the church, it's absolutely destroyed by Catholic teaching. First, first of all, the church is infallibly defined that it is a body. So to say that you're not united with the body is to say you're not united with the church. Secondly, the soul of the church was declared by Pope Pius XII to be the Holy Ghost. It's not an extension of, of the church, which includes the unbaptized. It's the Holy Ghost. Pope Leo XIII condemns the idea that the soul of the church can be separated from the body and compares it to dividing the two natures of Christ in one person. And Pope Eugene IV actually refutes this 
soul of the church heresy in his bull cantate domino by saying defining that the unity of the ecclesiastical body is so strong only for those who abide in it are the sacraments of profit to salvation and the quote i was looking for pope pius the 11th mortality monumus number 10 he says the mystical body of christ is one and the same compacted and fitly joined together it were would be foolish and out of place to say that the mystical body is made up of members which are disunited and scattered abroad Whosoever, therefore, is not united with the body is no member of it, neither is he in communion with Christ its head. So he's saying you can't be any part of the church without being united with the body, refuting this idea that you can belong to the soul of the church without belonging to the body of the church. And we've covered, um, like St. John Chrysostom, who, and, who said the catechumen is a stranger to the faithful. And he says, for if it should come to pass that through the sudden arrival of death he should depart uninitiated, his portion is hell. Okay, so that's the teaching of the fathers. You see the necessity of water baptism, that catechumens can't be saved, repeated by all the fathers, including St. Augustine, who, as we saw, we waffled on the issue. Now, the biggest proof of, of what tr tradition teaches on this is, is, is found in liturgical tradition and the apostolic burial tradition. And the church has always refused ecclesiastical burial to unbaptized catechumens. And what's interesting is the Catholic Encyclopedia is forced to admit this, even at a time when modernism was growing. It said that some people try to say that, you know, there was a, a tradition for burying catechumens in ecclesiastical ground. And he says, the Catholic Encyclopedia says, there's no tradition for this anywhere. It says, quote, there is not a vestige of such a custom to be found anywhere. The practice of the church is more correctly shown in canon 17 of the Second Council of Braga in 572, neither the commemoration of sacrifice nor the service of chanting is to be employed for catechumens who have died without baptism. That's the teaching of tradition, that catechumens are not in the faithful, they're not in the church, they're refused ecclesiastical burial. That's the, the universal teaching of the church tradition. There was no tradition otherwise. The constant teaching of the church that baptism is necessary for salvation, you'll find that everywhere yeah and the exceptions that certain saints held was not the universal teaching of the church and so for those to pull out a quote from a fallible saint who's making errors in the same document here or there and say this is the teaching of the church by that fact it's ridiculous uh, i want to go to pope saint seresius okay. here pope saint seresius in 385 this also is an extremely interesting quote um this was a letter to the bishop of tarragona and it's concerning those who die before baptism. So basically catechumens, people who are preparing for baptism. And he's talking about, he says, as we maintain that the observance of the Holy Paschal time should in no way be relaxed. He's talking about how traditionally and very often catechumens received baptism. They were instructed and then received baptism during Easter time. And he says, we should maintain this, this uh, idea and this practice. And he says, but those who are in the want of Holy baptism should be secured with all possible speed if they're in any danger. For fear that if those who leave this world should be deprived of the life of the kingdom, for having been refused the source of salvation which they desired, this may lead to the ruin of our souls. He's saying that these people who desired water baptism, who die, they would be refused the source of salvation which they desired if they didn't receive the water of baptism. He's explicitly rejecting the concept of baptism of desire. Pope St. Seresius. And he goes on, Pope St. Seresius, in this letter, if those threatened with shipwreck or the attack of enemies or the uncertainties of a siege or those put in a hopeless condition due to some bodily sickness, ask for what in their faith is their only help. Let them receive at the very moment of their request the reward of regeneration they beg for. So baptism, the sacrament of baptism, water baptism is the only help for salvation. And this is also interesting because it shows that the delay in baptizing catechumens, some people say, well, if baptism is necessary, why do we wait sometimes to baptize catechumens? Well, the church has never universally held that you have to wait. That's why in, in the Gospels and in the New Testament, we see baptisms immediately, you know, very quickly after people are instructed. They, they waited often to test people, to show that they were sincere and that, and that they really wanted it. And this proves that that waiting period is not in any way contrary to the belief that these catechumens can't be saved without baptism. Because in the very context of referring to the waiting period, he's saying that these people who die before they get there are refused the kingdom. Now, I think it's important to go to, uh, as you were saying, Pope St. Leo the Great. And this is his uh, 
famous dogmatic letter to Flavian uh, at the Council of Chalcedon. And if you read any church history book, any anything on the early councils, uh, they make reference to this famous tome or dogmatic epistle of Pope St. Leo the Great to Flavian because it was so uh, important in clearing up the heresy which denied that our Lord Jesus Christ had two natures. And this expressed the apostolic truth of his two natures in one person so clearly that all the fathers of the council started chanting when his letter, this letter was read out at Chalcedon or Chalcedon, Peter has spoken through the mouth of Leo. Okay, they started chanting this. And what's interesting is in this letter, there's an incredibly relevant teaching on this issue. Now, it's first important to understand that we must understand, what do these people say who believe in baptism of Tsar? Now, everyone admits that you cannot be saved without being justified. You must be removed from the state of sin and put in the state of grace. That's called justification. And everyone admits, no matter what side of the argument you're on here, that you cannot be freed from the state of sin except through the blood of Christ. That blood must be applied to you, okay? And it washes away your sin. And this is it's important to quote this passage from Trent, where it says, If anyone asserts that this sin of Adam is taken away, either by the forces of human nature or by any remedy other than the merit of the one mediator who has reconciled us to God in his own blood, let him be anathema. So no one is saved without the blood of redemption. Okay? Everyone agrees that. The baptism of desire people would say, well, your desire... By your desire, you are granted the blood which washes away the sin, and you are granted the spirit of justification. We point out that the church teaches you must be born again of water in the spirit, and it's in the water of baptism that your, the blood of Christ washes away your sins. Now, what's interesting is Pope St. Leo the Great is, is addressing these very points, and he says, Let him heed what the blessed apostle Peter preaches, that sanctification by the spirit is effected by the sprinkling of Christ's blood. 1 Peter 1, 2. So, Justification comes about by the sprinkling of Christ's blood. And he goes on to say, And because the Spirit is truth, it is the Spirit who testifies. For there are three who give testimony, Spirit and water and blood. And the three are one, 1 John 5. Now, some people actually have tried to say that this is an example of three baptisms, and we see how, how wrong this is as we keep reading. And Pope C. Lee the Great goes, commenting on those three things, the Spirit and the water and the blood. He says, in other words, the Spirit of sanctification and the blood of redemption and the water of baptism. These three are one and remain indivisible. None of them is separable from its link with the others. Okay, so he's saying that the water of baptism, the spirit of justification by which you're put in the state of grace, and the blood of redemption which washes away your sin, they're inseparable. None of them is separable from its link with the others. What's the concept of baptism of desire? That your desire, without water, separated from water, gives you the spirit and the blood. It's totally contrary to this infallible teaching of Pope St. Leo the Great. This is a dogmatic epistle. And actually, Pope St. Galatius says that if anyone argues concerning the text of this epistle, even in regard to one iota, and does not receive it in all respects reverently, let him be anathema. So if you argue even the slightest way about this teaching, you're anathema. And in this infallible dogmatic epistle of Pope St. Leo the Great, one of the most famous epistles in dogmatic history, he says the spirit of sanctification and the blood of redemption and the water of baptism cannot be separated. And baptism of desire says the very thing that they are separated. And, and, and also I think the authority of this docu document, this letter, it was important to discuss, you know, that people realize that this is the infallible teaching of the Catholic Church. On this issue, what St. Leo the Great is stating here is what you have to believe. Okay, and that's the key. Here is what God is protecting. And yeah. I think that we should quote some of the, the things that we have that prove the authority of this. Um, yeah, it was, as we said, Pope St. Galatius uh, anathematizes anyone who argues with, about it at all even dis disagrees with it in the slightest way. Uh, it, was, it was approved again by Pope Vigilius at the Second Council of Constantinople in 553. It was approved again at the Third Council of Constantinople. These are dogmatic general councils in 680. It was repeated by Pope Pelagius II in 553, Pope Benedict XIV in Nuperadnos. We have the quotes to Denzinger in this book where these are repeated. And 
any church history book, though, would acknowledge that Pope St. Leo the Great's famous tome to Flavian was dogmatic, and it's one of the most famous dogmatic pronouncements in, in church history. And so what's interesting about that is he's saying that the water, the blood, and the spirit are inseparable. And the Council of Trent infallibly defined, in the process of saying in Session 5, it says, God has reconciled us in his own blood, okay, made unto us justice, sanctification. In other words, justification comes from the blood of Christ. And it goes on to say, or if anyone denies that the merit of Jesus Christ is applied to adults as well as to children, by the sacrament of baptism, let him be anathema. In other words, the sacrament applies the blood. Uh, the St. Benedict Center, who actually holds that you can be justified without receiving baptism. And so this dogmatic teaching totally condemns that idea also, that you cannot have sanctification and redemption separated from the waters of baptism. So this was unfortunately, even though Father Feeney held correctly that you had to be born again of water and the Holy Ghost to be saved, he believed when he was asked the question about can justification happen without receiving water baptism, he said yes. And actually this, the teaching of the Catholic Church teaches authoritatively that, you know, sanctification and redemption are received when you uh, receive the waters of baptism. And so that's something that actually they reject, unfortunately. Yeah, and, and now as we point out, there are, People could be confused before they've seen all this evidence on the idea of baptism of desire applying to catechumens. There's a great difference, as we were discussing, about the idea. Any saint who believed in baptism of desire or any doctor of the church, they only applied it to catechumens. And we saw that's not the teaching of tradition. That's not the infallible teaching of the church. But the saints who did believe in it, and we'll discuss more about this, only applied it to catechumens. So there's a great difference between those who believe it applying to catechumens, even though they're both wrong. And those who apply it to Buddhists and Jews and pagans, which is most people. And those people are just, once they see the dogma outside the church, there's no salvation, they're just lying. If they, if they claim to say they believe in outside the church, there's no salvation, while they believe that Buddhists and Jews, etc., can be saved. Now, regarding believing that one could be justified, as he was saying, Father Feeney mistakenly held, and, and believing that a catechumen can be saved, before you've seen all this evidence refuting that uh, position, one could be in good faith, you know, thinking that was the teaching of the church. But once you see all this evidence, all these dogmatic teachings, okay, not theologians, but infallibly defined teachings saying and proving that you have to be a sacramentally baptized member of the church, everyone, to be saved, it's just bad will to continue to insist that you anyone can be saved without baptism. It does no one any good, furthermore. It just s serves the heresy of indifferentism because almost everyone uses it to justify the idea that souls can be saved outside the church. And one of the, the reasons that a lot of people believe in baptism desire, despite all this evidence we've promoted, is that St. Thomas Aquinas in the Middle Ages, he taught the idea of baptism of desire in a su Summa Theologica. And again, he was basing this on the erroneous passage in St. Augustine. And as we've shown, St. Augustine himself rejected that idea. And St. Thomas, people should know, was not infallible, of course. He was a tremendous doctor of the church. He's a canonized saint, but he uh, he was wrong about things. Yeah, like the Immaculate Conception. He didn't believe Our Lady was conceived immaculately, which was an error. Yeah, and people, you know, today will come up with the most ridiculous excuse to try to say we didn't really believe that. But, I mean, we have the quotes. Again, He's, trying to make a man infallible yeah, in that, everything. that's right. Trying to make a man infallible, and he was just simply wrong. And what's interesting is in Summa Theologica 3, question 68, article 2, explaining his erroneous position on baptism of desire he says a man could obtain salvation without the sacrament of baptism and he's only talking about catechumens okay by means of the invisible sanctification what's interesting he's saying sanctification without the sacrament we just saw pope saint leo the great infallibly saying that sanctification is inseparable from the water so we have a contradiction there and there's no necessity to believe that he was necessarily even aware of what pope saint leo the great said on this. And, and also the definitions on papal infallibility, some people misunderstood that issue. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. That Pope Pius IX defined uh, papal infallibility in 1870, okay? And as we pointed out last time, even though the root of it was found in the early church about how the chair of Rome cannot, you know, err, it wasn't understood exactly how it applied 
until 1870. And we see this, for instance, like St. Alphonsus. He's another uh, theologian and doctor of the church. That people, he believed in baptism of desire following St. Thomas, and, and which is, as we see, not tenable according to the teaching of the infallible dogmatic definitions. But he quoted things in favor of baptism of desire which were non-infallible. For instance, he quoted this letter. This is another thing that, that we actually, in this book, Outside the Catholic Church, There's Absolutely No Salvation, we address all of the objections that people raise on this issue. And he quotes the wrong passage. You know, when he, maybe you want to discuss that. Yeah, we mentioned it last. He quotes Session 14, Chapter 4, where it talks about the sacrament of penance in the Council of Trent. And he applies that to baptism of desire when it doesn't mention anything about baptism in the passage. And so he's making a mistake. He quotes a letter of Pope Innocent III as if it's infallible when it's, it doesn't meet the requirements of infallibility at all. So he's making mistakes in his process of defending baptism of desire. And so this idea, following St. Thomas, because he believed that catechumens could be saved without the sacrament of baptism, lots of people, out of their tremendous respect for him, because he was such a, an incredible theologian in, in so many ways, they this perpetuated and cert, only catechumens okay this idea that applied to buddhists and jews you know was not held yeah in fact actually here's a quote in 1760 he says quote how many are born among the pagans among the jews among the muslims and heretics and are all lost and this is that, saint alphonsus. yeah saint alphonsus is speaking and then he says again if you are ignorant of the truths of the faith you are obliged to learn them every christian is bound to learn the creed the our father and the hail mary under pain of mortal sin Many have no idea the most holy trinity, the incarnation, mortal sin, judgment, paradise, hell, or eternity. And this deplorable ignorance damns them. And then he says, uh, this is in the book Preparation for Death, 1760. Quote, how thankful we ought to be to Jesus Christ for the gift of faith. What would have become of us if we had been born in Asia, Africa, America, or in the midst of heretics and schismatics? He who does not believe is lost. This, then, was the first and greatest grace bestowed on us, our calling to the true faith. O Savior of the world, what would have become of us if thou had not enlightened us? We would have been like our fathers of old, who adored animals and blocks of stone and wood, and thus we would have all perished, end quote. So we can see St. Alphonsus totally rejecting the idea that's believed by pretty much everyone today that claims to be a Catholic, that people in other religions can be saved. You can see him clearly denouncing that. And so the people who say, I'm with St. Alphonsus on this issue. Yeah, when you read these quotes, you ask them, so do you agree with St. Alphonsus on these issues, what he's saying here about all the Muslims, all the Jews, all the heretics are all lost? Do you agree with that? Well, I don't exactly agree with that. So you find out exactly how far... They're willing to agree with St. Alphonsus. And how dishonest they are. And, and dishonesty is, is a key on this issue because in all these things we're covering, there's so many little things that these heretics try to twist. That They try to elevate fallible passages and, and make them binding. They try to pervert the teaching of other things. They take other things out of context. Dishonesty characterizes this entire issue. And maybe we can quickly cover St. Alphonsus, why he believed, he said he believed in it, quoting the Council of Trent. We can quickly show how the teaching of the Council of Trent, how it's actually not saying what a lot of people think it's saying about, you know, these people have the belief that, well, the Council of Trent taught that baptism of desire is something that can achieve justification. Yeah, the, the, this passage is, is really key because it's at the heart of this whole thing. In Session 6, Chapter 4, the Decree on Justification, it's talking about the transition from the state of original sin to the state of justification. And it declares that this transition to justification, once the gospel has been promulgated, cannot take place without the laver of regeneration or a desire for it. As it is written, unless a man is born again of water and the Holy Ghost, he cannot enter the kingdom of God, John 3, 5. And now, this has been mistranslated in Denzinger, the source of Catholic dogma, where they tra mistranslate the word without, sine, to accept through, okay? That mistranslation is used by almost all people who are quoting this passage. They quote it wrong. It should say without. Now, when you, when you examine that, this transition to justification cannot take place without the laver of regeneration or a desire for it. As it is written, it doesn't say that the transition to justification can take place with the laver of regeneration or the desire for it. It says this transition cannot take place without the laver of regeneration. For instance, if I said this shower 
cannot be taken without water or the desire to take one. That doesn't mean that I can take the shower by the desire alone. Or if I say this sacrament cannot take place without matter or form. That doesn't mean that the sacrament can take place by form alone. And actually, when it's talking about justification, it's talking about the justification of the impious, those above the age of reason. And so that's why it's saying that both are actually necessary, that if you're above the age of reason, you have to desire baptism, as is found in the Catechism of the Council of Trent on page 180. When it's talking about the intention you know, and on receiving baptism, the intention that's necessary, it says, quote, in the first place, they must desire and intend to receive it. So that's what actually this is talking about. Those above the age of reason have to want to be baptized. They have to desire to receive the sacrament. And and so that's key. It doesn't say it can happen with this or that. It says it cannot happen without this or that. Now, you could see how someone might misread that, you know, and that's how St. Alphonsus did. But what really is illuminating on this is if you look at the rest of it, the very same sentence, which these people who want to promote baptisms are, they very rarely quote. Okay, now before I quote that again, I want to point out that if baptism of desire were true, okay, if Trent were teaching baptism of desire, that would mean that Trent is teaching in this passage that there are exceptions to being born again of water and the spirit. You could desire. You don't need, every man does not have to be born again of water and the spirit. Therefore, the true teaching of John 3, 5 would be non-literal. Okay, that's even admitted by baptism of desire advocates. They say, that the greatest argument against it is, quote, that the words, unless a man is born again of water and the Holy Ghost, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven, mean the absolute necessity of water baptism with no exceptions. The great question is, how did the church explain these words of our Lord? This is a believer in baptism of desire. They say, well, it's not a literal understanding. The church doesn't understand those words literally. And if baptism of desire were true, the church would not understand those words literally. But in this very passage, it says, this transition, once the gospel has been promulgated, cannot take place without the lab of regeneration or desire for it. As it is written, unless a man is born again of water and the Holy Ghost, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So in the very same sentence these guys quote, it's saying, as it is written, unless a man is born again of water and the Holy Ghost, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. It's not a, a different interpretation. There are no exceptions. It's exactly as it's written. That means unless a man is born again of water and the Holy Ghost, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven, clarifying that the true meaning of this passage is not what they say. It's what we're saying, the necessity of baptism. And this is further proven when not only you examine this part of the sentence, but when you examine everything else Trent said about the necessity of the sacrament of baptism. Let's look at the canons. Trent has canons on the sacrament of baptism. If baptism of desire and blood were teachings of the church, the Council of Trent had every opportunity to include that. It could have said, if anyone shall say that there are not three forms of baptism, let him be anathema. Do we find that? No. Here's what we find. Canon 2 on the sacrament of baptism. If anyone shall say that real and natural water is not necessary for baptism, and on that account those words of our Lord Jesus Christ, unless a man be born again of water and the Spirit, are distorted into some sort of metaphor, let him be anathema. So it's anathematizing anyone who would distort into a metaphor, John 3, 5. In Canon 5, on the sacrament of baptism, if anyone shall say that baptism is optional, that is not necessary for salvation, let him be anathema. And then we also quoted earlier the decree in section 5 where it's saying, for unless a man is born again of water and the Holy Spirit, and it makes no exceptions. So all of these understandings, all of this clear teaching of Trent on John 3, 5 is all consistent. In every one, we see the sacrament is necessary in one. We see you can't distort John 3, 5 into a metaphor in Canon 2. We see a literal repetition of it in Session 5. And in this passage that they like to quote, Session 6, Chapter 4, we have in the very passage, right after the words they quote, as it is written, unless a man is born again of water and the Holy Ghost, confirming that what we're saying is the true understanding, not what, the, what they're saying. And this is the only thing they even can quote in the whole history of the dogmatic teaching of the church. One other thing is the instrumental cause. Like we're talking about the necessity of the sacrament of baptism and what Trent said about it. Well, we also see in session six, chapter seven, where it's listing the causes of justification. It could have explained baptism of desire here, but no, we don't find it at all. We find instead that the instrumental cause of justification is the sacrament of baptism, which is the sacrament of faith. Without faith, no one is ever justified. And it goes on to say that catechumens, 
beg of this faith before the sacrament of baptism. It says catechumens from Apostolic Tradition, the Council of Trent, section 6, chapter 7, beg of the faith. They don't have it. That's the teaching of Trent. And also, it's important to note that this idea of invincible ignorance, as we were saying, was not held by the early church. Like, obviously, if you can't be saved without baptism, that means anyone. No one can be saved without baptism. And the fathers of the church, addressing the question of cultures which have never been penetrated by the gospel, they say that they are not penetrated by the gospel and, and exposed to it because of their own bad will. And we have a quote, for instance, from St. Augustine in 426, expressing the mind of the early church. Quote, Consequently, both those who have not heard the gospel and those who, having heard it, have been changed for the better, did not receive perseverance. Okay? So he's saying that those who have not heard the gospel and those who heard it and fell away, none of these are separated from that lump which is known to be damned. Okay, so all the people who haven't heard the gospel. St. Prosper of Aquitaine says the same thing. And we see this in the, in the missionaries. And St. Augustine explains, he says, God foreknew that if they had lived and the gospel had been preached to them, they would have heard it without belief. And St. Thomas Aquinas says the same, same thing. He says that if uh, there's truly someone of goodwill out there, that God would either send a missionary to him or enlighten him by supernatural means. And we see that in the gospel. We see, you know, God enlightening St. Paul. We see uh, Cornelius being told by an angel. And you have St. Paul saying in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 and 4, if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. So again, you know, uh, teaching this also in Scripture. Yeah, and there's actually a very interesting quote that's going to be in the second edition of this book, which was not in the first edition, but it's from Father Francisco de Vittoria. He was a famous Dominican theologian of the 16th century. He said, quote, when we postulate invincible ignorance on the subject of baptism or of the Christian faith, it does not follow that a person can be saved without baptism or the Christian faith. For the aborigines to whom no preaching of the faith or Christian religion has come will be damned for mortal sins or for idolatry, but not for the sin of unbelief. As St. Thomas says, if they do what lies in their power, accompanied by a good life according to the law of nature, it is consistent with God's providence that he will illuminate them regarding the name of Christ. So Father Francisco of Vittoria, expressing the tradition of the church here, famous 16th century theologian, says, when you postulate invincible ignorance on baptism or the Christian faith, it does not follow that people who are invincibly ignorant of baptism or the Christian faith can be saved. They're left in ignorance through idolatry or their other mortal sins, and they're not condemned to hell for the sin of unbelief, meaning rejecting the gospel if they never heard of it, they're condemned for their other mortal sins. That's the teaching of tradition and repeated by Pope after Pope. For instance, Pope St. Pius X, the Cherubo Nemus, he, he reiterates this about how those who die in ignorance of the essential mysteries of faith will be lost. He says, and so our predecessor, Benedict XIV, had just caused a right. We declare that a great number of those who are condemned to eternal punishment suffer that everlasting calamity because of ignorance of those mysteries of faith which must be known and believed in order to be numbered among the elect. And, and also one other point before you discuss th that issue is that some people would say, how could God allow this to happen? Confusion on this issue. Well, like St. Paul says in 1 Corinthians eleven nineteen, he says, quote, for there must be also heresies that they also who are approved may be manifest among you. So God allows these things to happen so that he can sort of see who is of goodwill and who is of bad will. Uh, who is going to accept the truth and who is going to you know, reject the truth? Did you want to address Pius IX in this one? Uh, maybe you could, we could quickly just cover that and also the Father Feeney issue, just the basic points. Well, yeah, the, the, the heresy really exploded in the 19th century after some statements of Pope Pius IX where he's discussing invincible ignorance. Now, and these statements have been perverted and misinterpreted and used to deny the dogma. And we have a section on these addressing this in the book, which explains it in, in detail and, and covers it. But first, these two statements, one is an allocution, a speech to the cardinals from December 9th, 1854, singulare quadum. It's not infallible. It's a speech to the cardinals. It, it doesn't carry the weight of a dogmatic pronouncement. Okay, and he's, he's speaking of those, he says, those who are affected by ignorance of the true religion, if it is invincible, are not subject to any guilt in this matter before the eyes of the Lord. That's all he says. Okay, meanwhile, he, in the same document, he repeats the necessity of the church. That's true. 
they're not those invincibly ignorant as we just were discussing they don't go to hell for disbelief in the gospel they go to hell for their other mortal sins okay so what he says here is absolutely true those who are affected by an ignorance of the true religion if it is invincible are not subject to any guilt in this matter that's true they're condemned for their other mortal sins okay and he goes on to say the gifts of heavenly grace will assuredly not be denied to those who sincerely want and pray for refreshment by divine light. So he didn't say that they can be saved without the Catholic faith. He condemned that many, many times. He condemned it over and over again in his in his speeches and encyclicals. We quoted them earlier. I mean, we could quote them at length. But people have used this. It's so evil because they take this one passage and this other passage we're going to mention to deny the whole necessity of the church. And it's not even infallible. Even if he were teaching that, it wouldn't be a justification for teaching this. Because he'd just simply be wrong. Okay, because a pope is not infallible in everything he says. Okay, and so this is so evil. And this is why after this time, basically all the theologians started promoting this idea that, well, you don't actually have to be Catholic. You could be united to the church through invincible ignorance. And that's why you find theologians and catechisms from 1880 and 1890. And this was all the process that built up to Vatican II where the necessity of the church was thrown out the window. But that's really why. Yeah, in fact, you have Pius IX stating, for example, on December 8th, 1849, quote, in particular, ensure that the faithful are deeply and thoroughly convinced of the truth of the doctrine, that the Catholic faith is necessary for attaining salvation. And, for example, on June 17th, 1847, he says, for there is one universal church outside of which no one at all is saved. So these people would say, well, yeah, he did believe people who are, quote, invincibly ignorant could be saved. And you have, obviously, these other statements where he's condemning that, too. And the other passage that the people who try to deny the dogma quote from Pius IX is 1863, Quanto Confissimorum Mariare. It's an encyclical letter addressed to the bishops of Italy, okay? It wouldn't rise to the level of a solemn dogmatic definition. And he says, We should mention again and censure a very grave error in which some Catholics are unhappily engaged, who believe that men living in error and separated from the true faith from, and from Catholic unity can attain eternal life. So he censures and condemns the idea that men living in error and separated from the Catholic faith can be saved. Well, what are all these guys saying? That very thing. He's condemning that. And he goes on to say, It is known to us and to you that they who labor in invincible ignorance of our most holy religion and who zealously keeping the natural law and its precepts engraved in the hearts of all by God and being ready to obey God, live an honest and upright life, can by the operating power of divine light and grace attain eternal life, since God will by no means suffer anyone to be punished with eternal torment who has not suffered the guilt of original sin. So he says that those invincible ignorant can by the operating power of divine light and grace, come to salvation. Well, what's divine light and grace? Well, we quote in this book, we have passage after passage, the divine light and grace refers to receiving the gospel. Ephesians 5.8, you were in darkness, but now light in the Lord. First Thessalonians 5, 4 to 5, you are the children of the light, the believers. Colossians 1, 12 13, who has made us worthy to be partakers of the lots of the saint in light. And we quote 1 Peter 2, 9. And again and again, receiving the gospel means receiving divine light and grace. So that's obviously what he's referring to there. He's not saying that people can be saved outside the church. Now, we agree the statement could have been much stronger. It was weak, and the heretics have used it. But it's dishonest for them to, to do so. And also, he's such a long-reigning pope. I mean, all these years he makes one or two statements that they try to jump on those two statements and say, here he's teaching, you know. That you don't need the Catholic faith to be saved. Yep. So, And so this built up to the Father Feeney incident, where Father Feeney, thoroughly strong Catholic priest, who we, as we expressed, he, we believe he was mistaken in good faith on his explanation of justification, but held the necessity of the church. He was simply seeing this denial of the church everywhere. The priests at Boston College were denying it. The, you know, the, the so-called bishop at, at that time, who was the Benign Brith Man of the Year Award winner, who totally rejected. He said, only Catholics can be saved. I reject that. That's or nonsense. Word, word, nonsense. That's what he said. So this is something where Father Feeney was actually converting hundreds of people to the Catholic faith. He was causing a lot of controversy. He was telling people that this is necessary for salvation. And a lot of bishops were getting upset. A lot of liberal heretical priests were getting upset. And so they, they wanted to you know, condemn Father Feeney and the devil more than anyone else wanted to condemn Father Feeney because he was actually doing, obviously, a lot of good by converting people to the Catholic faith and preaching the gospel. And here were some of the things that were said to Father Feeney and those who were with him, reaffirming that the true meaning of outside the church and salvation, that it really means what it says, as it was once declared, as Vatican I says. 
that, for instance, Father Calaire, the president of Boston College, he said, Father Feeney came to me at the beginning of this situation, and I would like, would have liked to do something except that I could not agree with his doctrine on salvation. He, Father Feeney, kept repeating such phrases as, there is no salvation outside the church. So we're seeing that the president of Boston College, a priest, supposedly, saying that he doesn't agree with outside the church, no salvation. Okay, he had fully imbibed this heresy, this indifferentism, this uh, watering down of outside the church, no salvation, which is a denial of it. And then when someone responded that that phrase he refers to as a defined dogma, Father Calaire, the president, said, the theologians at St. John's Seminary and Weston College disagree with Father Feeney's doctrine on the salvation of non-Catholics. So the liberalism was so engulfing areas of the pre-Vatican II church that he was almost alone at that point, just before Vatican II, saying that you actually have to be Catholic. These people were all saying that you can be saved as a non-Catholic. And this occurred, it's very interesting to remember, in Boston. This, this whole thing where the priest who was bringing this before the, the world at the time, he was saying, this is ridiculous that we're saying that people can be united to the church and this is contrary, this is heresy. Okay, this all occurred in Boston. He was as local as he was saying, Masonic, uh, so-called Archbishop Cushing, was opposing him. Okay, and basically what happened was Cushing wrote to Rome to oppose Father Feeney, say, what's going on? He's saying that you have to be Catholic. And by that time, members of the Curia and, and high members had imbibed this heresy. And the letter that was written back was called Protocol 12249. It's called also called Suprema Hoc Sacra. It's this letter from a member of the Holy Office, Cardinal Marchetti Salvagiani, who's writing back to the Archbishop of Boston, Richard Cushing, about Father Feeney's, what he's saying. And so it's a letter of a bishop. It was also signed by Cardinal Ottaviani, who some people think was a conservative, but he wasn't. He signed Vatican II and went along with the post-Vatican II apostasy. But so these two cardinals writing back to the Archbishop of Boston. Now, is that an infallible teaching of the church? No. Okay, this is Protocol 12249, Suprema Hoc Sacra. 1949. It's August 8th, 1949. It's quoted by all kinds of these people. This is what the Society of St. Pius V goes by, Society of St. Pius X, CMRI. They all quote this as the true explanation of outside the church, there's no salvation. And this basically said that what Father Feeney is saying is wrong. Okay, so in other words, non-Catholics can be saved. And there are clear heresies in this letter. It talks about... Instead of proclaiming the dogma that every human creature must be subject to the Roman Pontiff, it says that those who, knowing the church to have been divinely established, but who refuse to enter, cannot be saved. So it changes the meaning of the dogma from every human creature to those who have heard the church and know they have to enter, but don't. Well, obviously, I mean, that's ridiculous. If only those who believe the church is divinely established and rejected are lost, it would be a disservice to try to convince people that the church is divinely established. Because only the people you convince would then be an obligation under pain of damnation to adhere. Yeah, to. and then it talks about invincible ignorance and those who are invincible ignorance of the Catholic faith, which, you know, obviously as we saw was heresy because no one can be saved outside the, outside the Catholic faith. And then the clear heresy, indefensible heresy in Suprema Hoc Sacra, it says that those who do not belong to the Catholic Church are by no means excluded from salvation. But on the contrary, they're in a condition, it's, it's tempting to quote something else. And it's saying that those who do not belong to the, the body of the Catholic Church are not in a condition necessarily of damnation and not necessarily excluded from sal eternal salvation. Well, even people like Monsignor Joseph Clifford Fenton, he was a defender of Protocol 122.49. And we could maybe talk about his errors in the future. But he says that it's wrong to say that you can belong to the soul of the church without belonging to the body. He says this is ridiculous. Well, Protocol 122.49 is saying that those who do not belong to the body of the Catholic Church are by no means excluded from salvation. That means those who by no means belong to the church. And Eugene IV says the church is th this ecclesiastical body. So therefore, if they're not part of the body, they're not part of the church because the church is a body. Exactly. The, those who do not belong to the body of the Catholic Church, if they can be saved, that means you don't have to belong to the church because as he was saying, the church is a body. And what's interesting is that Pope Pius XII in Humani Generis, talking about those who deny this dogma, he says some reduce to a meaningless formula the necessity of belonging to the true church. Well, that's what this heretical letter, Protocol 12249, did, and what all these traditional groups promote, thinking that they're promoting the teaching of the church and they're actually promoting heresy.
And, and also you have Pius XII and Mestici Corpus Christi of June 29, 1943, stating that only those can be counted as members of the church who profess the true faith and have been baptized and have not left the church by heresy, apostasy, or schism. So we had the case, then they asked Father Feeney to report to Rome, and he had a right under canon law to know what charges were being lodged against him, why he was being called to Rome. And so these cardinals that he was dealing with gave him no charges. They they didn't give him uh, why they were calling him to Rome. They just said, come to Rome now. Yeah, so once this protocol 122, by the way, was promulgated or sent out, the headlines all, all over said that the Vatican declares the no salvation dogma to be false. That was actually a headline that ran once this heretical protocol letter was published, that the public could understand that what the Vatican was saying here was that the dogma, if, if this is what you're saying, there there is salvation outside the church. Okay, but it wasn't an infallible teaching of the church. The, the letter claims that Pius XII approved of it, but there's no signature. And this gets us to a point, it's important for people to understand that Pius XII, while he didn't say anything directly heretical on this issue, he was very weak. And he his inaction and lack of, of coming to the defense of Father Feeney was the bridge to Vatican II. And also, the people who knew Pius XII said that Pius XII w never wanted to offend anyone. So if Father Feeney was stirring up people and getting people upset, maybe it's something Pius XII, while well, he may have agreed with them, obviously, and we believe that, we presume he did, that you have to be a Catholic to be saved, maybe didn't like the fact that he was upsetting people, you know, was going about it maybe in the wrong way. And we also don't know what these cardinals were saying about Father Feeney to Pius XII. They may have said to Pius XII, you know, this radical priest out there, we, we've told him that, you know, you want him to come to Rome or he should come to Rome, and he's just not going to come. He just feels like he doesn't have to. So it's this, this rebel priest that just, you know, is flagrantly disobeying commands. And so we don't know what exactly was said. And, and so he was, once this heretical letter came from Marchetti Salvagiani to the heretical Archbishop Cushing, they said, Father Feeney, do you accept it? He said, no. He then received letters to come to Rome, as he was saying, and canon law requires that if you're summoned to Rome, you need to know the reason for the charges. He did not, they refused to give him the reason why they wanted him to come to Rome. And he said, well, I'm not going to go unless you would give me the reason. And so eventually they excommunicated him for disobedience, not in solemn form, but in common form. And the excommunication, obviously, is, is ridiculous. He, he was acting in accordance with his right to know why they wanted him to come to Rome, and so they just excommunicated him. and For disobedience. And this was the death knell of the dogma in the minds of the world because they said everyone was taught or you know com had come to believe that they excommunicated a priest for repeating that outside the church there is no salvation and that therefore people can be saved outside the church. And that's why also, like, even a lot of people that discuss even that even sometimes preach outside the church there is no salvation, they'll say outside the church there is no salvation objectively. You know, this objective, subjective heresy that, you know, as far as like objectively you have to belong to the church. You know, well, you can't say that about dogmas of the faith. You couldn't say Jesus Christ is objectively the son of God. You just can't say that about dogma. It is true. And you have to believe it. It's not just objectively true. And then this has led also to almost over 90% of the heresies that have been promoted by the post-Vatican II Church and these anti-popes are denials of outside the church there is no salvation. And also, all these different false apparitions that are popping up have also promoted this idea that you don't have to be a Catholic to be saved. We have, quote, Our Lady of Bayside on August 14, 1979, this this quote, quote, my son is repeated over and over again. For remember always that in my father's house there are many rooms in the mansion signifying faiths and creeds. Of course, you have our uh, the quote, Our Lady of Medjugorje, stating, you know, the seers promoting that people don't have to be Catholics to be saved. This is uh, Ivanka saying, one cannot truly believe to be a true Christian if he does not respect other religions as well. And then she said, quote, the Madonna said that religions are separated in the earth, but the people of all religions are accepted by her son. And then here was another question that went to Ivanka, quote, is the Blessed Mother calling all people to be Catholic? Answer, no, the Blessed Mother says all religions are dear to her and her son.
So you see this promoted by the antipopes, promoted by the false apparitions, an effective denial of, of the teachings of the Catholic Church. And, and what's interesting is if you ask, if you went around to some Novus Ordo churches and started to, or called them up, and you ask the priests what they believe on the necessity of the church, if they're knowledgeable at all, most of them would, or think they're knowledgeable at all, most of them would make reference to this Father Feeney incident. They would say, oh, yeah, the church condemned outside the church yeah. of salvation. They all, we've called them up. Yeah. Okay, you talk to them. So you can see that the root denial of this, uh, this thing was huge. This, this condemnation of Father Feeney, which was not a uh, solemn action, it was not a, a infallible action, and it was for disobedience, not doctrine. Okay, and he was simply, he was right. He was reiterating the teaching of the church, and it was so evil. It, and yeah. what's very interesting is that this occurred in Boston, and with the Novus Ordo Church's sexual scandal that exploded in the uh, mainstream media a few years ago, it's, it's fascinating that where was the explosion? In Boston. That's where it all started. And what is going on in Boston now? The Archdiocese of Boston is reportedly considering filing a claim in U.S. Bankruptcy Court. Uh, here, here's an AP headline from December 18, 2003, about how bad it got in Boston. The sex scandal in the Boston Archdiocese has shaken the church almost literally to its foundations. To help pay the $85 million settlement reached with more than 500 victims of child-molesting priests, the Archdiocese has mortgaged its seat of power, the Cathedral of the Holy Cross, and is putting up for sale the Archbishop's residence. And you can see this all across the country but, in other dioceses, but principally started in Boston. And it's symbolic that, that God said, so because they persecuted this priest who was repeating the teaching of the church, okay, God allowed all these just perverts to come in, okay, so that now basically they have to mortgage the very seat of power the symbol of the whole diocese. They yeah. have to mortgage it. And even the bishops that allowed these pedophile priests and these homosexual priests to infiltrate the seminaries and never said anything, shifted them around, moved them from seminary to seminary, moved them out of the state into another state. The reason why, even if they weren't homosexuals themselves, is because they don't believe you have to be a Catholic to be saved. So therefore, anything goes. They don't care if these guys are you know, homosexuals or you know, committing sins and so forth, because they don't believe the Catholic faith is necessary at all. They either believe everyone's going to heaven or they don't believe in God at all. So this is why this is happening. And this is why our Lord says in Luke 18, 8, when the Son of Man returns, do you think he'll find any faith on earth? It's why he says when he returns, it will be as in the days of Noah. Basically, eight people out of the entire world, God spared. So it's going to be a similar situation when he returns again. There's going to be almost nothing left. Because primarily the denial of this dogma outside the church, there is no salvation.